Good evening. We're going to start the meeting. I'm going to ask Mr. Harrison to introduce the students. Good evening, uh, Dr. Conway, Mr. Bird, Mr. Picardo, and of course, ladies and gentlemen of the board. Thank you very much for coming to Vernon Center Middle School tonight. And as customary, I know we like to start every meeting off with the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, and I'd like to introduce some of our students who have uh, so graciously volunteered to come and help us. They are a little nervous because I told them this will live on in infamy as it will be on television soon enough. But I have sixth graders Tommy Rhodes and Rachel Blanchard, and also seventh graders Josh Galena and Karina Putnam. If we can come down here, please. That's what we received. Uh, if you recall, this was the conversation that the board had in, uh, in August when we were applying to be a member of this network. I know that uh, Mr. Burt has worked very closely with, um, with our, our grant writer and uh, with the other people involved in this. So if you don't mind, Mr. Hull, may I turn this over to Mr. Burt, please? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I did speak with um, Mr. Andy Rocket at the high school. Uh, and he did speak with Mr. Al Slobodin from the um, Vernon Youth Service Bureau. And both of them are very excited about this opportunity. They feel that this is uh, a way for them to reach out to a population of students and that the funds would be available for both release time and providing substitutes and also for unknown uh, events at this time. Um, ranging from including, you know, if it's an identified group, going to some leadership training um, and those types of things for interventions. It's, if you look at the rate response network, it really is targeted for a very specific group of students. And it is, you know, we have a, uh, a new initiative at the high school in terms of truancy and students coming to school late that he felt that this fit in well with the school goals in that regard. Um, I guess the confusing part for the board would be that they specifically state in their literature is that you should not come in with a budget. Instead, you should go for the training and then determine your budget after that. So I think that is of some concern. But I have full assurances from Mr. Rocket, uh, as well as from Officer Langless, that they would be able to use these funds to great advantage for a certain group of students at the school. Thank you, Mr. Burke. Ms. Sark, does that uh, help with your concerns? Or do you have any other questions? Clear is when I started. I would move to approve item 1.1F. Thank you. I have a motion to approve Ms. Goldich for seconding the motion. Is there any further discussion on that motion? Seeing none, you can call for a vote by a show of hands. All in favor? And that's unanimous. Thank you. Okay. 
item 2.0, uh, secretary's report, and 2.1, opportunity opportunity for the board to add or delete agenda items. Does anybody wish to add or delete agenda items this evening? Ms. Fisher. Um, I'd like to add agenda item 5.15. Cave recognition and 5.35, which is leave of absence. Okay. I have a motion to add 5.15 cave and 5.35 leave of absence. Mr. Percy? Second. I have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, I'm going to call for a vote by a show of hands. All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Was there a question? I'm just not 5.15 and 5.13. Yes, because. No, 5.35. One's going to come after 5.1 and the other one's going to come after 5.3. Okay. Um, I'm going to add agenda item 5.15 and 5.13. Uh, are there any other items to be added or deleted from the agenda this evening? Seeing none, we'll move on. Item 2.2, Rockwell High School Student Representative. Good evening. Good evening. I was definitely interested when I pulled into the Board of Ed building and saw no one was in the parking lot. <laughs> 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 uh, so it's kind of been a slow-ish kind of time at school just because we're getting back in the swing of things. But the marching band had its first competition down in Groton this weekend and um, got the highest score of any of the bands there and received almost all of the captions which are like best visuals, best color guard, pet like just small things like that which they can give out to bands who may not have gotten the highest score in their, in their division but have something really spectacular that they want to point out. Uh, let's see. Model UN has started up again and I like to say that I'm pretty much running it just because uh, our advisor has a lot of meetings during the time and we've really tried to recruit a lot more kids and we're planning on going to the UConn conference, which is a learning conference for some of the new people. And we are hoping to go to the Boston College conference, which is later in the year. And I've been kind of prepping some of the new kids as to what goes on in some of the topics and they're actually really interested and I think it's going to be a really good year. Uh, football has been going. Uh, <laughs> it's definitely a better year, I would say. Especially with a lot of school spirit, especially the food truck has gotten a lot of attention. Um, a man who was on chop actually is coming in and helping with the food in the food truck and selling hamburgers and different things. And I guess there was like an hour's wait in line because people were so excited to see what the food was. And it was, I heard some annoyances because they're like an hour for a hamburger, but I heard it was really good. Also, Spirit Week is next week, and so that's always fun to see people really showing their Rockville pride. And I'm sure there are going to be the usual like crazy hair day, blue and yellow day. I'm sure there will be pictures, many, many pictures that you will see either in the yearbook or in the Rockville newsletter or what have you. But it will definitely be interesting, and it's always a fun time. Mr. RHS prep is starting, and that's personally one of my favorite times of the year, especially since it's my class. We get to see people starting to prep and think about who's going to be Mr. RHS and start their talents and asking escorts and it's really a fun time for the school. Uh, as I started last time, I'd like to point out just a couple of good things that Rockville has to offer. And the first thing I really want to point out is the guidance counselor office. I know that going through the college process, dealing with some struggles in school, no matter what they be, I've always found a place helpful in the guidance department. My guidance counselor is fantastic. He always handles things just as they should be, and I feel better when I leave his office, no matter what the situation is. He knows exactly what he's talking about, and I feel so comforted like to know that that resource is there. Also, the teachers. I just like complimenting the teachers because I know sometimes they get a lot of flack from people, but I've never met a teacher in my four years that has was not willing to put a time time aside to give a student extra help, to stay after, to come early, just to help them achieve, which I think is absolutely amazing because I know in other districts, people have gone in for extra help and the teachers just say they're not available. And so I really appreciate that and I know it's helped me a lot and I know it's helped a lot of other students and it really shows the dedication on the teacher's part. So that's it for tonight. Thank you.
Thank you for your report. Uh, board members, any questions for our student representative? All right, thank you. Okay, moving on to item 3.0, community forum. This is the opportunity for comments on the agenda items, potential future agenda items, or general information provided to the board from citizens and community organizations. Is there anybody who wishes to speak to the board this evening? Please come forward and state your name and address for the record. who wishes to speak this evening. Seeing none, I will, their community forum is closed. We're going to move on to item 4.0, curriculum. Item 4.1, approval of Connecticut Common Core. Mr. Burt uh, shared uh, brief, and Mr. Testa sh shared briefly with the curriculum committee the new Algebra One curriculum that's been developed by the state. This is the first of the eight curricula um, that are being developed by the state, including a uh, common assessment at the end of the, the curriculum unit. And I, I think they actually have some tests for you this evening to, uh, to give out, so be ready. Remember your Algebra One. Uh, the, uh, this is all about the Common Core Standards. It is rigorous. It is changing uh, the way we think about the way we teach. So as I said, this is the first test, uh, the first, excuse me, the first curriculum that is out from the state. Uh, it teaches in a new way, uh, very, very different problem-based learning. Uh, it's very different from what uh, we're experiencing. And so uh, I believe Mr. Byrd is going to be asking the board to allow this year for a pilot and uh, and then hopefully by the end of the year we'd be coming back and asking you to go forward with this curriculum uh, fully next year. Uh, but we're looking to pilot in all of our algebra classes. I'm going to turn this over to Mr. Bird, if that's all right with you, Mr. Holt. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Bird. Thank you. Thank you very much. We do have a presentation on the floor. We'd like they can see it. If you want to relocate. <laughs> And you know, Ms. Mrs. Uh, Barker Jones also has a presentation next. So, well, good evening, everyone. I'm very excited to be bringing forward this uh, this pilot proposal along with Mr. Testa here, as you know, as our STEM coordinator K through 12, uh, and we we are bringing forward an Algebra One pilot curriculum. And just to kind of give you an idea of what our goal for tonight is, we are looking to have you approve a pilot for all of our 8th uh, and ninth grade algebra classes uh, from the State Department of Education. 
as well as to approve, uh, we'll be going through an official approval process for to give us uh, give you a sense that we are looking to transfer textbook funds um, from a textbook account into our technology account to purchase technology to support this new curriculum. And also to kind of explain how this is a culture shift in many ways. And finally, what I don't have up here is hopefully answer many of your questions I'm sure you all have. Before we begin, actually, if you could go into your packets, there is a green form in there. It says exit slip. So before we get too far into the process. I think it's in your blue folder. In your blue folder, I apologize. So just to give you some background of what brought us to this point, why we're bringing this forward, we do have an approved curriculum from the board, uh, I believe it was 2010, that we've been using for the past three years. Uh, but what happened this year is that uh, as part of that process, we put in textbooks money into the budget to purchase all, set in, uh, all new textbooks for Algebra 1 with all 8th and ninth grade students that are in those courses. Um, and part of that process, I asked Mr. Testa in his new role to explore the textbooks that are available to us. And part of, I also asked him to try to find an online textbook as well, or one that would at least support it online, so that we could do a comparison, essentially a pilot study of textbooks, and to see what is the best fit for our students. As part of that process, he did some exploration and then came across some training this August um, for the new state model from, um, I'm sorry, the new algebra model from the state. Uh, he was able, before school started, to go along with two teachers from the district and for two days of training and came back and said he believed, and as well as the teachers believed, that this was an excellent model for our curriculum and that we should take a look at using it this year. The best part about it is it's accessible. As you know, I asked uh, in the last meeting that everyone take a look at. There is a guest site. I'm sure some of you were able to get into that and take a look at some of the resources. But as you know, all the resources are available online and it's free. So the pilot in that sense is low risk uh, in terms of funds. Why are we asking to do this? One of the reasons is, of course, from the state uh, in 2009 came out with a new high school reform. And part of that reform was a requirement for all high school students to complete Algebra 1, which Dr. Conway has mirrored in her recent set of goals, which for all students uh, to complete Algebra 1 by ninth grade. One of the things we're also looking at is our retention rate in Algebra 1, which is, we feel is, is higher than we would like it at this point. And we do have to do some exploration to those students who did not pass the course last year and do some analysis of why that happened. Um, we haven't done that yet, but we're hoping that part of the problem is the pacing of the course, as well as um, the traditional textbook that was a part of that course. Also, we're looking into the textbooks. Um, Textbooks, as you know, have been the foundation of most courses for, for decades. Uh, the problem with textbooks, of course, is once you purchase them, you own them. And they are static. And it's very difficult to update them. And typically, I'm not sure what Vernon's process is. I apologize for that. But in my previous districts, it was about a 10-year cycle for textbooks. Uh, also, during that time, I know from personal experience that uh, on a regular basis, you purchase about 10% uh, new textbooks every year, even for existing textbooks, either through increase in class sizes, attrition of those textbooks, you know, damage, etc. So you can imagine over 10 years, if you're purchasing 10% every year, you essentially purchase a whole new set over 10 years. And finally, it supports our Vernon strategy for improvement, which has become core to our work here in the... In the yes? What's the retention rate? At this time, it's approximately 50 students from last year's classes. That was from ninth, ninth grade. I don't believe we had any students retained from eighth grade. Yeah. Thank you. So, which is higher than we obviously would want in that course. Uh, and again, we support Vernon's strategy for improvement. I'll go over that a little bit later. Just to give you some background on the state development, um, that you have the PowerPoint in your packet from the state, and I'm not going to go over that in detail, but just to give you some highlights. This is what they consider a model curriculum. It is not something that they've done overnight. It's taken them three years, over three years. They've had over 80 teachers as well as other experts from uh, colleges as well. Uh, it's been in 30 diff different districts over the past few years, all gone through the pilot process to, to improve and continuously change it as necessary. Uh, one of the best aspects, in my opinion, is that it's, it's backward design. 
And very simply put, is you go with the ends in mind before you design anything. Say, what do we want this to look like? And what do we want kids to know and be able to do before you even think about what it looks like on paper? And that was significant. They came up with some serious standards. And one of the most important things was the pacing and in, in basic in having students all have accessibility to this curriculum. Obviously, we want to make sure that it's Common Core based, Common Core State Standard based, which it is, is perfectly aligned with that, as well as embedding 21st century skills, which, as you know, is not just technology skills, but it's uh, other important skills that are necessary for our students to be successful in career and in uh, college, if they so choose, uh, things like collaboration. So it is a, a well developed uh, product from the state. Quickly go over some of what we believe are some of the advantages of going to this, this model curriculum. First of all, it's adaptable. And if you had a chance to look at it, but all of the all of the lesson plans are in Word format. They're in PDFs if you need to print as well. But in Word format, that means you can download and change it to the needs of your students, which is very significant for us. Uh, it's not again a static textbook or a static curriculum that says no. If it's day one, you have to do this. Day two, you have to do this. There are suggested activities by day, but again. That's up to the expertise of our teachers, or our highly skilled teachers, to take that and say, yes, I know my students, and we can do this, and maybe even improve on it, is what would be the goal. And that, when we sit down with those teachers, is incredible professional learning. You start with something and then say, how can we improve this? How do we reach more students? How do we bring them to a higher level of learning? That's incredible professional learning. It's easy to update, obviously. It's online. There's no printing. There's no binder sitting on a teacher's desk. You literally just Log in, if there's an update, you get a quick email, here's the update, and you don't need to make 40 copies for everybody. Pacing, this is significant, and this is a trend now across the country, is that if you're going for depth over breadth. It's not a mile wide and an inch deep. You are looking for things that make sense to students. And we know that it makes sense in this curriculum because they actually have, let's say there's eight standards in one unit, it's a four or five week unit, they have eight standards, they actually put in bold one or two standards that are key. So if you know your students need some more time to focus, you can slow down and focus in on one or, one or two of those power standards. And that's core to what they decided, that they're going to slow it down. Now that's how it's built. Obviously we're going to have to live with this for a while to see if that's actually true, but that's what they're selling it as. Jump in. Okay. <laughs> Another important part is differentiation of instruction. That's built in as well. It's not, and what does that mean? It means here's the lesson plan, but here's how you, if you need to reach students that don't quite get it, this is the way you differentiate to their level. Or if you have high-flying students, this is the way you can differentiate up to their level as well. So it's highly adaptable, again, in that regard. It's also collaborative. We, this is going to be one of the things I talk about in terms of mindset, but this is, this is key to it. There are built-in projects that are group-based where you do collective learning. We know from studies and also from our own experiences, I'm sure from your experiences, that you're better together than independent. We know that if you're given a problem to solve, that you work together, you, get, you reach higher levels of learning. And finally, he's talking about application. It's that real world sense that you're going to actually put things together that, that impact or make sense in the real world. It's not all abstract, and I'm going to show you an example of that later. And finally, excuse me, this is something that's coming, whether we like it or not, we're moving into a digital era, and we're moving into the idea of electronic textbooks. Uh, major publishers are moving in this direction, um, but also universities are producing their own textbooks, and for the most part, free. Um, EastCon, uh, through the work of John, Jonathan Costa, has produced one for U.S. history. It's a collection of artifacts, documents, and essays, um, different levels, and it's all free online. Um, also, coming down the road, I spoke about this with Mr. Ruffy yesterday, is that you know, the potential of a one-to-one -one model because we have the excellent wireless um, system at the high school. So there's a lot of advantages that if we do end up going to that down those road that we can take advantage of with this curriculum. I can just speak to the training. We went, uh, I was able to attend the training with uh, two of the high school teachers this summer. And uh, it was great because the presenter was actually uh, one of the teachers that has been involved um, in the past three years as part of the pilot program. She wrote the curriculum. Uh, and there are more activities, investigations, they call them. Uh, there's more information, more activities that they, they can actually use. So the teachers can really 
have the uh, advantage of picking and choosing and differentiating. She did really speak to that point of differentiating uh, and really having the materials at your fingertips uh, to be able to do that on a daily basis. Um, in your packet, you had an exit slip and every, every day um, at the end of the lesson, students are completing an exit slip, so it really gives teachers that real-time data on how students are doing as far as using that as a formative assessment to see how children are doing. Do they understand what the today's purpose of the lesson was? How many students understand it? How many students don't? Do I need to pull students in a small group tomorrow? Uh, do I need to set up a warm-up tomorrow when students come in to, to give uh, additional time and practice uh, in any particular area? So I think um, the flexibility of the documents uh, for teachers uh, is an advantage as well. Two of the teachers that went into the training this uh, summer just did one or two investigations uh, with, over the last couple of weeks with their classes. And they do have some uh, data, uh, something that they shared with me. As far as, far as the collaborate, collaboration, I know Mr. Burke spoke about that. Uh, students really enjoyed working in groups and doing the activities. Uh, one of the comments by the students was, was also that they liked that it was applying mathematics real world situations, so as well as in that. They, they commented, the teachers, both teachers commented that the students stayed on task. They had some great discussions about what they were working on. Uh, some of the challenges they said the students shared was that there was a lot of reading and writing. Uh, and I don't think that's a bad thing. I think we need to really stress and raise the bar as a common core state standards really ask us to do. Uh, I think that that's telling to the students, but also telling to the way we're instructing our students in Algebra 1 and teachers as well. They also shared that students did finish um, the tasks. They all attempted all of the questions. They may not have gotten all of them correctly, but the effort was there as well because they were engaged. And again, uh, this model really talks about students as active learners and um, students working in collaborative groups really speaks to our strategy for improvement and um, highlights a lot of the difficult areas in our strategy. Which takes me directly into the strategy for improvement. I, you know, Mr. Tessa covered a lot of that, but as you can see, we start with student setting personalized goals. You use the exit slip, you know what their needs are for the next day. It could be a small group, it could be five students, it could be the entire class didn't get a concept, so just slow down, reteach it. You don't have to move on into the content. Get, make sure that they reach those power standards before you move on. Uh, using the power of peers, that's collaboration. <clears throat> the curriculum, obviously, depth versus breadth, and we want complex and relevant, which it truly is. It's using different concepts in different ways, and articulating them through different activities. The teacher, you get to know your student, it has exit slips built in, also provides you the flexibility of adapting those to your students or whatever you taught that particular day. You can articulate learning targets. It's all there in the documents. It's actually provided for you. I'll show you a structure in a moment. And providing feedback, again, the exit slips will help with that. Uh, and the learning tasks, of course, we're looking for higher thinking, inquiry-based, and authentic application. Quick overview of the units, and this is all documented. I didn't want to provide you all of this. I'm just going to go over this quickly. Um, the unit overview gives you the context. Again, why are you doing this? So you, as a teacher, know what's the point of the whole unit. Why are we studying this? Which is kind of important to know, but as well, you know that as well as your students. Gives you a pacing guide, and again, it's a guide. One day, two day, four days for each activity. Essential questions, these are broad questions you want students to be able to deal with. What is a pattern, for instance? Uh, enduring understandings, that's what should they know at the end of a unit, end of a four week unit, they should know what a pattern is. Um, standards, obviously, based on common, tells you specifically which the common core standards there are. And as Dr. Conway said, we want to make sure that we have a guaranteed and viable curriculum for all of our students, regardless of what classroom they're in. Well, the vocabulary helps with that because you're going to say, we're all using the same language when we talk to students about X, Y, and Z. No pun intended. Um, and then the assessments, of course, at the end, they're provided for you, and it's correlated to the expectations of that unit. Uh, all the way down through, as Mr. Tessa said, the X and slips as well, correlated to that day's activities. Activity, then you get into activity, it has a launch or an opening, has a closure, how do you end the lesson, how do you end the activity, gives you some teaching strategies, again, these are just suggestions, you know, 
Our expert teachers will be able to take the material and go beyond that, but this is just a baseline. If we have a new teacher, we can hand this to them and say, here, you can, here's a baseline, and then collaborate with your colleagues on how to improve on this. And then it gives suggested materials. Uh, and then, of course, at the end, is practice for students. You've gone over the concept. Here's, here's this particular practice for this, for this activity. And the activity, the, the, the practice that I saw, and I let Mr. Tessa speak to this, but you, know, you think of worksheets or you know, those problems in a textbook. These were really well done, in my opinion. The, the, and again, I'm a social studies guy, so what do I know? But what did you think of those? Yeah, the, the feedback um, from the training the teachers went to, we were, we were introduced to the first four units, so we really focused on units one through four. Uh, but every unit, uh, the investigations that, 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 as they uh, describe that, uh, are relevant. Uh, as I, I shared before, they uh, really speak to that student engagement piece. And, and the feedback that I just shared a few minutes ago from the students as well, uh, you heard that the students uh, really appreciated that. They can make that connection to, uh, not just learning algebra, but there is a connection to that real world. So I think that's important as well. Just to give you a quick example, this is one of those activities. It's uh, paper cups, the, the unit is patterned with integers and they suggest two to four days. And one of them is you've actually tasked, your boss has tasked your team, uh, you're at a, you work at a paper cup company and there's different sizes of paper cups and you have to work with your team on packaging. And you have to establish, okay, if you stack up 10 cups, 50 cups, 100 cups, what is the dimensions of that packaging? And you obviously, if you get into a pattern, you start to develop the different uh, algebraic formulas for that. But the challenge is you're working with a collaborative team and then you have to establish you know, what's the pattern here and then you actually have to create your own graph, the graph is not labeled, so there's some other level here. And Mr. Tess and I were talking about how great would it be if we could expand this into other activities, what if you threw out them in different types of containers or if they could design a new container that would save space. So there's a lot of ways you can take this basic activity and then enrich it, enrich it and get them engaged in different ways. Um, what if you had different sizes, what if different products, you know, just translate this. And then that's an easy assessment. This is a, a um, performance-based task, and there's lots of ways you can adapt that. That's the exciting piece. Again, it's not static. You can change this. It, even with what materials you have on hand, we don't have a lot of paper cups. We can't purchase paper cups right now because, you know, you, whatever you have on hand, that, that, you, that works. You know, uh, so those are some of the advantages. Obviously, there's some challenges associated with this, and we want to make sure that we're perfectly clear on this and honest and transparent about that. There's a significant culture shift. Uh, you have to remember, we went through all the same process in high school. We all sat in those same classes, and we all had the same textbooks. And we brought those home, and we worked in the textbooks, and we brought our homework in, and we reviewed the homework, and then we learned the next piece. And then we moved on, we practiced, went home, did the textbook, etc. So this is a fundamental change in the mindset. This is the way education is going. The teacher is a facilitator. They're not a sage on the stage. And that's something that is difficult for some people to grasp, especially people who say, well, what if the teacher's not telling my kid what to do, then how are they going to know it? Or if the teacher's not teaching, then how are they going to get that? So that's a difficult. That is a challenge for some folks. But we know, we know through their own experiences, well, what's the best way you learn? And for the most part, people say hands-on, doing working with others, thinking about it, grappling with problems. And teacher to lecture, and then you know practice, and then come back together, work with a partner on the small problems, come back together. There is a place for that. We're not eliminating that entirely. But there should be an element where we're going to have student-centered instruction. They're working with small groups, they're working with a partner, they're working independently on these complex problems. And the textbook should be the center of that. Good core standards and instructional techniques should be the standard for that. And if we think about an algebra textbook alone, tech, basically if you look at a chapter, what does it do? It introduces a concept, it gives you a couple examples, and then you practice. Well, that's how this is essentially laid out. Here's the concept, here's how you're practicing, you're interacting with the material, and then you practice with those sheets you take home at night, and we come in and discuss that. So, it is a shift in mindset, and sometimes you get a challenge on that, but we know as educators that that's the best way for kids to learn, so you mix up the types of learning that they have. It's not one size fits all, and we know that, that that addresses most of the needs of our students in our classrooms. Also, the technology at home. This is a concern, obviously, it's digitally based, but again, you can print all of these, and you can have a stack of them, you know, the kids can pick up on the way out. They, you know, even if the student has a computer at home, maybe they like to do paper and pencil, they can bring that, that sheet home with them and work on it. 
Okay. So, but that again brings up the, the question of that one-to-one -one model that would alleviate the situation as well. I'm trying to anticipate some of your questions. Again, that idea of no textbook. You know, we feel strongly enough that there's enough support with this program that we wouldn't need a textbook. The next three kind of group together. We talked about no technology, how the access and material and printing costs, something I haven't talked about. We are going to monitor that. Is there potential for printing more of these, these activities? Possibly, but you have to recall most teachers already print things and use it in their classrooms already. So we think that that's not going to be an issue. Collaboration, I went over that before. Um, there's an issue in some cases where if it's strictly collaborative, well, you know, why is my son teaching you know, this other student? That's not the intent of this. We're using mixed techniques, as well as you know, your groupings will be mixed depending upon the needs of your students. You could say you have a group of students that are excelling at a particular skill and other students that are weak at that. You can mix them up, or you can do small group instruction where you do enrichment with a group of students that are high flying, and then students that need additional help, you can do some teacher instruction with that small group for 15 minutes. We have long blocks of time. There's different ways of varying instruction in that time period. How are we going to train the teachers? As we said, two teachers went for two days, but we don't speak to this. Yes, uh, the state is offering additional training this fall. Uh, it was on the website today. Uh, we, they do not have the uh, dates uh, shared yet. Uh, and when we went for the training, they uh, shared that it would be out probably in December, early December, November for units uh, five through eight. Uh, so there is additional training uh, free of charge. Uh, so we will uh, be putting together a team uh, that will attend the training in the fall. And since it is late December, our anticipation for the first semester is that teachers will explore some of these activities and they would start using them and bring back that information to us. But by second semester after the training, that they would integrate 80 to 90% of the material in their classrooms. Uh, we may need to purchase some of the material, like paper cups or I think they had, you know, um, maybe popsicle sticks and things like that. That there's some materials associated with it, but it's not a tremendous budget burden. Um, but, you know, we want to make sure that all that's in place before we implement this in second semester. So that'll be the process from now until January. And then finally, you know, the questions of a pilot, well, what happens in May or June when we come back and say, oh, it didn't work. Uh, but our anticipation is, is that there'll be elements, even if the whole, you know, there's, let's say at the units we didn't like the one on quadratic equations, we could still use that as a basis, as a draft to develop our own. Again, it's adaptable. So, they're, the fundamental concepts of algebra are in here. The state spent a lot of time ensuring that they are correlated to the common core and that the basis for good mathematics is in there. So that would be the same for us. We would have the same basis for good mathematics. And then if we felt, the teachers felt that there was some pieces that were weak, we would spend time making sure that we fill in those gaps. So again, to go over what we we're requesting, that we pilot this mostly second semester and that um, one thing I didn't speak about tremendously is that um, we would request that we want um, smart boards in the seven classrooms of the seven teachers, mostly because a lot of this material is interactive. Uh, you know, I showed you that graph. It would be great for students to be able to come up on a smart board and use the graph and fill in the graph right in front of their colleagues. You can save that material. You can print it out. You can export it to your web page or a blog or anything like that. So there's a lot of interactivity. But again, we're moving to trying to save printing costs. This is one way to do that for a long range down the road um, to make this even better interactive material. So I want to thank you, and we're now available for any questions. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, just pick up. Thank you. Uh, I know you have a mention the uh, Savings. Please put your mic friend closer. Uh, no textbooks. What is the downside of this program or this plan that we have? As, as far as the expense? I mean? Are you talking expenses? Or? No, no, in general, totally. Is there a downside? I didn't see a downside, to be honest with you. Uh, when, when I went for the training, as a former teacher and a lifetime, lifelong teacher, uh, I really uh, love the uh, accessibility of all the materials right at my fingertips. Uh, we've developed curriculum the traditional way. It's come in a binder, uh, and sometimes those binders you know, sit on a shelf, so this is really interactive. Uh, 
and I think um, as we move forward into uh, an electronic society here, I think it, it really speaks to the way we are learning. Uh, just think if you want to know something, the first thing you would go to is your computer and pick up you know, Google something. So everything's right there available for you. Uh, and I don't really see a downside. Uh, it will be interesting with your approval of the pilot. Uh, as we're moving forward, I'm sure the teachers will have some questions. And we'll address, like any uh, curriculum document, a curriculum document is something that we're always revising and we're always adding to and changing. So uh, this really speaks to that uh, very well, I believe. Just all the funnies to put on. My main concern is, come the end of the year, and we see results not as planned or as proposed or as uh, That's my concern at this point of time. Early on, are we aware of those and possible pitfalls at that point of time? Well, it was. Um we, we went to the training as a three-year pilot program, and the presenter, was, as I, I mentioned earlier, um, has been involved in the program uh, in writing and in implementing uh, the pilot over the last few years uh, in a Durham school that's very similar uh, to our students' needs. Uh, so that was con that, that made me feel confident in a, uh, in a sense that uh, you know we're comparing students that are like our students. She's also developed over the last few years, um, supplementing the curriculum in many areas, whether it's homework, whether it's, um, she, she shared her email address with it, she already sent out uh, some additional materials to supplement that. So throughout the revision process, the curriculum has been revised over the last three years, but she herself has tailored it to her students' needs. So. I think for us, access point, we're getting in at the perfect opportunity. Maybe three years ago, the conversation might have been different because the curriculum was first introduced, like anything, you know, uh, when, when things are first introduced uh, from concept, you see that you want to make some changes. So I feel confident that uh, this is the direction that we want to go in. It's aligned perfectly with the Common Core State Standards, and um, we need to change some of our instructional practices to meet those needs so our students will be college and career ready. So I think, I think this is what we should be doing at this point. You still have floor, Mr. Thank you. Uh, uh, if the if a family always, uh, let me take it back. I think we are assuming that every family will be able to have or provide the children at home the technology needed? No, we understand that not all children have uh, access to te technology at home, and I think that's what uh, makes the this curriculum it's accessible for everyone, whether they have the technology or not. Uh, we do have the access of the wireless uh, network at the high school, and I think for us it was the first opportunity to take that step into the digital age. We're always We've been talking about the concept. Now we do have um, the technology in place. I think this would be a great first step for us as a district to see and work out the kinks. I'm sure we're going to have kinks. And I think that we have all the materials available. So whether a student um, has technology or not, that should not be um, the, term, the determining factor. We want all students to have access um, to the materials either way. So. It's not a requirement that they have technology at all. It's not a requirement that they have okay. technology. Right. Thank you very much. Ms. Fisher. Um, you said that two teachers were trained in the summer, and then yes. you're going to train all the rest of them in December? I'm not sure. Sorry. Yeah, there, there's a team. Uh, usually the, the state, when we went for the training, they, they asked for teams of four or five. So I have three uh, teachers at, at DCMS, eight grade teachers that currently teach Algebra 1 and four teachers at the high school, so I haven't gotten into that much detail yet of how many um, staff members we can, teachers we can send to the training, but uh, they had asked for five, four to five teachers. Well, I'm a little confused because um, you said they were going to be covering units five through eight in December? Yes. So what happens to units one through four? Well, we, we had asked that. I think the, the original plan was that they were going to offer some training for units one through four as well, but I, I haven't had access to um, to that material. Over the summer, they did offer um, 
several trainings for units one through four. <coughs> However, they know that districts are at different points uh, as far as implementing this. Um, so I'll get more information, but I, I'm, I'm under the uh, assumption that they are going to offer some training for both units. So, so for the first half of this year, the teachers are going to be teaching algebra as they've always done. Traditional, yes. And then, so they'll be covering things that were in units one through four, and then the second semester they will cover things that are in the units. My, one my conversation with them was to really identify one or two units for the second semester that would fit into where you are as far as your timeline is concerned. And really, um, once you identify those two units, implement those. Um, and then in terms of not buying textbooks and technology, that's just for second semester also. Yes, we would be asking for the official transfer, um, the next Board of Ed meeting in October, and then you know, it would take some time to purchase that material and install it. So the textbooks that we were going to buy were going to be for the next school year anyway? They weren't going to Correct. be for this school year? Correct. All right, so you're going to try to buy seven smart boards, that should help? Yes. Yes. Ms. Bush. Um, you said you had gone out looking at some of the uh, programs that are available for Algebra 1. Were any of them comparable at all to this um, state program curriculum? They, they all came with a textbook, so uh, in that regard, no. Uh, they did have an electronic version uh, of the text, but they were more of the traditional based um, text. So no, this is, it's unique. It, it's, um, it's the first opportunity when I spoke, spoke with Mr. Burr uh, as I went to the training late in August. Uh, there was an opportunity for us to learn about a new uh, curriculum and it is definitely a step uh, away from a traditional textbook based curriculum. Maggie, thank you. Um, yeah, you talked about it being adaptive to the needs of the students and the teachers. Uh, will the state be adapting it from feedback from some of the pilot uh, they have, districts? Yes, they have done that over the last three years, and I, I believe they're going to continue to get feedback uh, from uh, the pilot districts. So we haven't officially adopted that and become a pilot district, but certainly they were, they're were. they always looking for ways to improve, and they've done that over the last three years. And they've made some, I think, um, significant changes according to what our presenter uh, had shared with us. I think that many of the school districts are struggling to get materials for the new Common Core. A lot of the publishers have not gotten up to speed, and I'm hoping that the state continues on making uh, curriculum for the different areas so that it's easier for the school districts to provide. And I think, I think um, one of the challenges we have, uh, a lot of the publishers are smart, so they they create a uh, textbook and they're aligned to the Common Core. They, they stand it, it's aligned to the Common Core state standards, but is it really? So when I saw this curriculum, it really um, excited me in the sense that, uh, as we shared earlier, students working collaboratively, students working problem solving, developing curriculum, all those um, indicators that are included in the Common Core, this curriculum has it, so. As well as the SBAC. Um, which is the, the assessment associated with the Common Core um, standards. In the SBAC, there's a number of um, types of assessments that are called performance tasks, and that's actually part of the assess the activities that are embedded in the state curriculum. Is, you know, that cup one is a performance task, and it's working. You actually, in the test scenario from the SBAC, there are times when you collaborate with your, your fellow students before going back and completing your own work. So it mirrors not just the, the Common Core, but the assessment that, that, is, that evaluates the Common Core and your understanding of the Common Core. So there's a lot of advantage. And I also agree in terms of textbooks, a lot of times they'll take their old textbook and they'll throw in a couple extra sentences here and highlight some things in red that say this is the Common Core, but stand by and sell it. And then the digital versions, for the most part, are PDF versions. In other words, they're static text with some links on it to enhance you know, material or multimedia material, but it's not the can't take that, oh, I really like that, but I only like these three pieces of it, and I want to cut and paste that into a document and to give that to my students. This is, again, adaptable to our students. We can really, I want to emphasize that as well, that this is going to be 
it, it's not just here to the teachers that we're going to be spending time with them, we're going to give them the opportunities to work with the material and do what's best for firm students based on the sound model. So that's important as well. May I make the motion? You may. Uh, I'd like to make a motion that the Vernon Board of Education approve the new Connecticut Common Core Algebra 1 curriculum pilot. Second. I have a second. And is there a discussion on the motion? Mr. Kelly. Well, I have one more question. Yes. Um, I'll just comment that we went to a convention not so long ago and were advised to be very careful of the statements made by vendors about what's prepared for the Common Core and not to believe a word of it because their feeling was that very little had been properly prepared to align to the Common Core standards. And uh, I don't know if you've been advised of that as well, but we certainly heard that loud and clear. Um, I would like to ask about the smart boards you referred to. Uh, System-wide, I don't know whether or not we're, uh, we have uh, activated all that we've purchased such that we may or may not have to buy seven more. Uh, I would like uh, to know before we are asked to approve, approve seven more that everything we have has been uh, installed and is operable. Uh, it's not only a matter of ins installing it, but are the teachers that to whom uh, the device was assigned, uh, did they turn out to be people that are uh, user-friendly and, uh, and uh, adaptive to utilizing a smart board. Not everybody loves them. I mean, I think they're great, but not every teaching professional adapted to them uh, or may not have adapted to them. So if there's any resource available to us before we go buy some more, we'd like to know that. I will make sure I'll have that information for you, especially the first question. Uh, whether or not we've activated anything that we purchased. The second question is a little bit more difficult and a little more evaluative, trying to determine if teachers are fully utilizing those. So I, I can't promise that I'll have that by October 14th. Mm -hmm. I'll definitely have the first question answered. So if I could, uh, the, the facilitated learning that you talked about uh, and the training of teachers in, in delivering it uh, is, is great. but. I haven't heard any discussion of training of uh, evaluators on how to look at facilitated learning. This is an evolving um, technique. Uh, you said clearly everyone over the years has had a procedure and that this is a, com a significant departure from that. So how do you fairly look at uh, whether or not the uh, teacher is delivering this new facilitated learning the way it ought to be if they're... That, that's a great question. Our strategy improvement really speaks to that. Your what? Today, our strategy for improvement, which uh, was one of the slides that Mr. Burke had showed previously that... So if you look, that's our, really our strategy area of focus. So every teacher in the district, not only will have to create a uh, learning objective for their students, but they will also have to uh, identify one of those indicators as their uh, area of focus for the year. Now this morning, I started my day over at BCMS, and I went and I did some walkthroughs of all of the 6th, 7th, and 8th grade math teachers, and looking, using that as a rubric. So we have a rubric uh, that all the administrators are tasked with doing at least 50 uh, walkthroughs uh, from now until December 1, I believe. Um, so this morning I went through, as I said, uh, all of our um, math teachers at BCMS, and I really was able to collect data uh, in a non-evaluative way on how are we implementing this strategy. So we'll, we'll take a look district-wide and see uh, where are our needs as a district as far as the implementation of this strategy. And I agree well, but that is our goal for the year, really, is to look at instruction, curriculum, and assessment in that order, primarily. Um, I am doing walkthroughs with principals. I did uh, with Mr. Rocket today. 
assignment uh, as well this afternoon, and we're calibrating our expectations. And I'm the chief academic officer, if you will, in regard to that. And my expectation is that we will have varied teaching styles when we walk in those classrooms. Um, and I'm proud to say that we are seeing that, so that's the good news. But uh, it is my job is to calibrate all the administrators, ensure that we're all looking for the same things. We are using our own professional learning time for the, the, to, to do that calibration as well by looking at teacher videos. Um, we have access to some online videos of teachers from different disciplines, not Vernon teachers, but these are from national collections. And we are going to do that calibration to ensure that we're all looking for the same thing, both for the evaluation process um, to guarantee that we're, we're, we're being equitable for our teachers, but also for our improvement strategy to make sure that we are actually implementing what we say we want to. So that, that is my responsibility, and I, and I am fully aware of that and, and look forward to that work this year. Mr. Hull, may I add to that? Thank you. Um, through you, Mr. Hull. Um, Mr. Kemp, the rubrics that we're using, the Common Core of Teaching, and uh, just prior to this, the Charlotte Danielson Rubric Framework for Teaching, um, it has four categories, a below standard, a progressing, um, a proficient, which is where most of us uh, live all the time or hope to live in proficient, and then an exemplary, um, the, which is the place we visit and we don't always live. Um, the exemplary is all about students, and so everything that is explained in the first three parts of the rubric that the teacher might um, be having kids do thus and so, in, in the fourth level in the exemplary, it's all about the students taking over. And that's really what this course is all about. It's that collaborative learning, the students determining um, you know, the, the course of their, or their learning, certainly within the, uh, the structures and the, the goals that are set out by the teacher. But that's the, that's the big difference. And so in terms of evaluators, uh, knowing what teachers should be doing um, when, they're, when they're facilitating work as opposed to being the sage on the stage, um, they, the rubrics are very clear as to what should be happening in the classrooms if facilitated learning is taking place. Okay. Mr. Kemp, you still have the floor, but I'm going to take five seconds and give Mr. Baldwin a TV timeout. So, Mr. Kemp, you have the floor. Because my impression of what facilitated learning might consist of means that at any, in any given classroom, there's always going to be something different because each student is different than what's going on in the same Algebra 1 class down the hall. And I wouldn't expect them to be the same. So how do you, you really do this evaluation fairly, knowing that it's all going to be different? Because each kid, as I said, each kid is different. He learns differently. The way you're trying to facilitate his learning just means it's going to go off in a direction that you can't even control. That's the way the kid's going to go. Right? And then you got 20 different kids going in different directions, and that's a good thing, I suppose. That's why you're doing this. But then how do you evaluate it? It's hard for me to understand how that's going to come together. The, the, the standards are uh, common for all grade levels. Uh, the assessments, are the common assessments, so that when teachers get together uh, during their department meetings or their data team meetings, they can see and have those conversations about uh, looking at their class and seeing you know, how their students are performing. And you know, those conversations can start. And I could say to Mr. Burke, well, I'm noticing your students did very well on, on that particular question, and my students didn't do as well. What, are you, what did you do? You know, those are the conversations, those are the professional conversations that we can have, and we can set up opportunities for teachers to uh, observe each other. Those, those are the things that we want to push or as far as um, having the conversations and getting teachers into each other's classrooms. But the standards, the, the assessments, the exit slips, those are common assessments. How you get there is really up to the teacher as far as their, their knowledge of one of those um, bullet points is know your student. So uh, I will know my student on a daily basis, my students, and I will be able to uh, adjust my curriculum. However, we're all headed in the right in the same direction all being evaluated um, utilizing the same standards. So it does give teachers the flexibility uh, where a textbook, uh, a traditional textbook may or may not you know, address that in depth, as in depth as uh, this particular curriculum does.
Thank you. Other questions? Ms. Golich. If you could go back to the technology issue for a minute. I believe it was part of Mr. Lemoy's uh, program for bring your own device to have a small number of devices that students would be able to take home. Um, is there a possibility that you could utilize some of those to, in essence, make sure that all the kids are on the same playing field? I think that's an excellent question, and one of the processes we're going to be doing over the next four or five months is really getting a clear understanding of what is available at home for all the students. Um, even if you ask, do a simple poll, like, is there a computer at home? Uh, that's, that's a great question, and let's say you do, but, you know, like me, I have four kids. You know, if there's one computer and everyone has homework, there's not a lot of, you know, access to that computer. Um, so there's, there's, there's different ways of asking that question to get us in the right direction. But that's something definitely I will explore and get back okay. to. Yes, sir. I was going down that same road. Um, in October, you, you're shooting for seven classrooms, correct? Yes. Will you know in October, when you come back and ask us to transfer that funding, how many classrooms you're going to need to supply? Yes, so we'll, we'll get an exact number if we have any, you know, smart boards lying around. Uh, we'll make sure. <laughs> Well, uh, we'll make sure we have an accurate count of, of, of all the material that's in the district and whether or not it's installed and make sure that's being utilized to its fullest and then I'll give you an accurate uh, accounting uh, through Mr. Picaro. So your goal is seven, but it may not get there. Oh, in terms of the funding piece? No, in terms of teachers ready to teach. I thought your goal was seven classrooms. Do you have two teachers on board now? Is that correct? And, and more to I'm be trained. Sure. Yes, um, the training is a two-day training, and really, um, that's just a, a launching point for the training. Uh, this year, uh, when the two teachers came back, the first few days, professional development days, I did connect the eighth grade teachers with uh, our grade nine teachers um, to really, the professional learning really starts when they get together and have those conversations. Um, today, I was up, uh, at the department meeting for Grade, uh, for math department at the high school, and one of the first things they asked for was to have more opportunities where they could connect with grade eight teachers and have those conversations, as I described earlier, about uh, the implement implementation of certain tasks, certain investigations, how to go, what worked, what didn't work, and then really dividing up the work. Uh, you know, our, our big focus this year is uh, collaborative effort, and really uh, asking teachers to really uh, work as teams to model that for. We want our students to work collaboratively. We need to really um, ensure that our teachers are working collaboratively as well. So the training, yes, it's a two-day training. Um, but I think the the real learning will be throughout the year as we schedule time for grade eight, grade nine teachers to, to collaborate together. So that's that's something that you know I've, I've thought about and uh, will certainly um, put into place uh, with your approval. Of the and differentiate. Uh, no, one of your one of your um, slides talked about the teacher knowing their student and then setting targets. Is there room in this curriculum for the gifted and talented student, or is it not that differentiated? No, absolutely. As I said, you, know, you can differentiate both. You know, for students in need of additional help as well as enrichment activities. There's actually some suggested enrichment activities embedded into the curriculum. So will testing student to student be different to them? Well, again, they're performance tasks, and so it's an inquiry-based type of assessment in many cases. You know, you're, other than, you know, a, a, a sort of a multiple choice type of assessment, there's these, you actually have to apply your knowledge to an authentic situation, and that can give you different levels of expertise to show the different levels of understanding. Um, in many cases, performance tasks are built, so there's a baseline where you, most students can access, and then there's additional ways to show your expertise on those assessments. And to go to the SBAC as well, it's an adaptive test, so it's online. In other words, if you're starting here, you answer a few questions correctly, the questions get more difficult. Same thing going the other direction. If you are not answering them well, the questions become easier. So we want to make sure that we're, we're mirroring that, mirroring that as well. Thank you. Other questions? Olivia. Uh, I don't mean to step on toes, but this is mostly curiosity and kind of what I've learned from some of the students. Um, from what I've learned, I'm sure that you guys have more information than I do. Um, 
this, these classes have no levels, correct? There's no more level one, level two, level three algebra, or honors algebra, is, there, is that being eliminated? Yeah, they've been phased out uh, as far as uh, instructing students in algebra, yes, there are multi-levels multi in one, one classroom. Just because I know from a lot of student concern, because there's been a lot of talk about state standards, and how they want to slowly phase out levels. There's been a lot of concerns about um, some of the more gifted and talented children are like, a lot of them do not like working in groups because they do feel they can do better independently. A lot of them, while if they are capable of much more, I feel like um, a lot of them feel like in a non-level class, um, they're not going to get the highest level of education. And I just want to point that out as, I know a big concern is a lot of kids going to magnet schools. And I feel like that might be one of the things, well, I'm well and above a lot of the kids in my class. Why shouldn't I be surrounded by other kids like that? And so I just wanted to point that out. And also, uh, I know that the general idea that the students have gotten from hearing about getting rid of levels was that um, some of the students who maybe aren't on such a high academic level might feed off some of the higher like, level kids and try harder and put more effort. That was what the students have learned. But I also just want to bring it to your attention that it may go the other way around. If there is a high level student surrounded by students who maybe should, would be normally in a general level class, they might start to slack off because they realize they can just get by doing a little less because compared to everyone else, they're doing a lot better. So I just wanted to bring this up because I know this is something that's been brought up a lot of time by teachers and classes. Um, a lot of the higher level students aren't exactly happy about the idea. So I just wanted to bring that up. Let you run with it. I'll try to address some of those, but there was some, quite a lot in there. So I'm going to just go with one, one piece about knowing your student. We ask teachers to develop assessments specifically for um, their different coursework. And part of their SLOs, or their student learning objectives that they need to develop for their courses, they have to identify specific, they actually, it's called IAGDs, and the acronym's escaping here, Indicators of Academic, academic Growth academic and Development. development. Okay, I got it back. <laughs> it's a specific data points, and so I have 25 students in one class. I have to actually group those students. So if I, if I have pre-assessment, five students are way up here, I have to actually create a goal for those five students for their growth over the course of the year. So there's a little bit of that leveraging into the classroom because of our new evaluation model. Um, and also, as I said, there's going to be some instruction with the teachers or some learning for the teachers as well to say, what, how do we group students? Um, because there's varying ways of doing it. There are times when it's appropriate to, to mix students of different abilities, and then there's other times where you separate those out and give different activities to students that are that are high flyers and can do more. You give them enrichment activities while the teacher can do some small group instruction uh, you know, with, with five students that need some additional work on a specific skill. That's why it's very important that we have these exit slips and we have these kind of assessments. We have these type of adaptive assignments because then you can say, oh, I have these students that need some additional uh, work because they're, they're or additional kind of concept and throw them some higher level you know, instruction or throw them some other assignments that are important for them to, to learn. Or, likewise, they can go and work with the teacher as well. You know, that, that, that small group instruction is really adaptive to a lot of different groups. Uh, I, I, I'm not familiar with the background of the D-level, so I'm not going to speak to that. Thank you. If I may, just, um, just another quick question. So, with the um, adaptability of all these assignments, is it possible for someone who may be a high flyer to get the same grade as someone who's not such a high flyer and but they'll have different level work so what may be a 98 for not a high flyer is that the equivalent of a 90 for a high flyer I'm just curious about how the grading is going to work because it's so adaptable for each student how is that going to be graded and weighted fairly it's essentially assessments are going to become assessments okay. so and they're going to be based on the common core standards. So the standards are aligned, the assessments are aligned to the standards, so we have expectations. And you know, for the most part, there's a minimum expectation where you master the skill, and then you can show above that. Um, similar to what the CMT and the CAPTA, there was always proficient, and then there was gold, and then there was the advanced level. Okay. And similar to that, you have a basic level. I think the difficulty is, is that we're trying to 
deal with standards-based, uh, you know, education with an old Carnegie Unit type of grade system that's from 100 years ago. So we're trying to match those two things up. As well as I understand, you know, people are trying to buy for college and all that important thing. Um, it's, it's, we're in a transition era, but I, I think there's enough, I, you know, you know, can jump in here. Um, there's enough adaptability, but the assessments are common. There's, there's no, it's, that's not differentiated. Those are identical. So Thank you. It's baseline based on standards. Mr. Kim. Would you like to ask some more questions? I'm all set. Oh, I was hoping you would. Um, how often is an SLO done, written, created, daily, monthly, weekly? The teachers create an SLO, student learning objective for the year. Uh, so they're in the process. Uh, last Friday was an early release day. Each building uh, administration kind of kicked off the whole process of you know, what an SLO is, how to develop it. So teachers are in the process right now of creating their SLOs. Um, they have to have two SLOs uh, based on uh, some pre-assessment data. So they've all administered or in the process of administering uh, some type of pre-assessment uh, to their students so they have a baseline uh, data point. Uh, then uh, they will meet uh, with their administrator uh, to have it approved, their SLOs approved. They'll have a mid-year conference and then an end of year conference. So that's kind of the overview So you said one per student per year? One, um, they have two SLOs based on their students. So they have two student learning objectives. Per student? Per class. Mr. Dr. Conway wants to weigh in. just also. add to that. Um, it's for all their students. So uh, the student learning objective may be somewhat general. Uh, it may be that um, uh, all of the students are reading on grade level by the end of the year or beyond grade level or all students will increase by uh, over a year's growth um, or by five levels or whatever it might be and yet then you will have several indicators of academic growth and development and so that would be the um, specifics of the goal you will say that um, these five students are going to increase by uh, seven levels because you, you believe they can and you're going to measure it in this with this particular test and These students are going to increase by ten levels because they're below grade level and these students are going to So that's the kind of thing you would say in your in indicators of academic growth and development So that's for the entire class. Yes, not per student. Correct The SLO is for the whole class and the indicators are for smaller groups of students, or it could be the whole class if you wish to, but most likely it would be smaller groups of students because all the students are never on that, uh, at the same place when they walk in the classroom. Ms. Arn. I still don't understand how excellent students, talented students, gifted students are going to be able to, to be differentiated so that that is apparent, um, you mentioned it, Mr. Burt, on college applications. Um, colleges still want AP courses and honors courses, and until they change their um, mode of application, then how, how are we going to accommodate those students? In a classroom, you're expecting the teacher to differentiate for 20-something students, and they all rise to their potential using the same. I don't, I don't understand how that can be accomplished. Well, my answer to that, because I've always experienced it in every district, is that realistically, you, for 25 kids, you'd have 25 different levels. So it's very, very difficult to say that we're going to have levels to accommodate every level of learner. Um, you know, but within, within a classroom, you know, that is the expertise of the teachers to know their students and to differentiate for their students and enrich those students as necessary. And if we move away from a classic model, you know, when I was in high school, a teacher standing delivering, and we're moving away from that. And again, I'm seeing that in classrooms here in, in Vernon. Uh, it, it, you tend that the impact of that is lessened on those students. That you're giving them enrichment activities, you're giving them inquiry-based learning. If you think about that, is a challenge for every student because they have to. You're giving them a problem to solve, and if you don't tell them the exact way to do it, and they have to explore and struggle on their own, then that's where the real learning occurs. So. If it's, if it's strictly, here's what I know, I'm going to tell you about it, and then you're going to tell me back, 
then yes, that's very difficult to, to differentiate because everyone then is expected to memorize the same stuff and give it back to be on assessment. If we're changing the way we teach, we're changing the nature of what we teach, and we change our expectations for those students. You know, this isn't happening overnight. This is a fundamental mind shift, mindset shift for our teachers into inquiry-based, authentic application, exploring ideas, working together in a collaborative process. That those ideas are possible to enrich every student. That's if, if you are strictly standing delivering a single message and you're teaching to the middle, it can't be done. But if you are changing the way you teach and you're challenging those students to solve unique problems, then that's the way that we can reach those students. I'd like a teacher who's doing this to come back and, and talk to us during, during the pilot. I'm, I'm very curious about how, and it, it's no reflection on a teacher's talent. I don't need that at all. I think the task is monumental, and I'd like to hear how they're accomplishing teaching to 25 different levels in the classroom. I can tell you, I came from a district that had four levels, and they, the teachers were asking for more. So, you know, there's, there's always that, well, I have this group of students and this group of students, and we need to get through the content, and I need to get through the, you know, by, by Christmas, you know, or by New Year, because they're going to have the test on this. If you change, we have to fundamentally change the way in which we create curriculum and we assess students. That's, and is it perfect in this model? No, I'm not going to sit here and say, is this absolutely perfect? And I, we have, a, I'm sure our, our teachers are, are nervous about this. It's a significant change, not just in algebra, but in all disciplines at all levels. It's a significant fundamental shift, and we're in the middle of it. And we, as our jobs, as administrators, to support them, but we also have to push a little bit, because we do need to move into this new way of thinking about teaching. You know, I grew up at, at teaching you know, for 14 years in that model. That's my experience. That's my student teaching was standing and delivered. You know, the best times in which I taught was always in that interactive, the students exploring, debating, doing a model UN type of thing. That's, that was my favorite part of teaching, was when I released responsibility onto the students and they did the learning and came back with stuff, I think, as you said, things that we couldn't even imagine. You know, if we have set expectations, set goals, and this is, you know, this is exactly the way you fit into this box, students are smart. They're not going to go outside the box. You know, so we, we have to set expectations. Is it, is it perfect in this curriculum? No. And you know, our teachers going to struggle with this? Absolutely. And that's our job to support them. Thank you, Mr. Hull. Just add um, two things. Um, one is that we have, uh, not to my knowledge, we've never had honors algebra one in, uh, at Rockville High School. Um, that's taken care of in eighth grade. And uh, we do have honors geometry for those students who took algebra one in, uh, in eighth grade. The, um, the other is that this has nothing to do with advanced placement or early college experience courses. Those courses we are trying to continue to add and push our students. That's one of our goals, is to make sure all students are college and career ready. And so the more students who are taking um, early college courses or AP class, the, the better. And we're encouraging students to do that, to challenge themselves and to take those courses. So, so this doesn't have to do with this particular um, discussion. That is, that is an absolute goal of ours, is to increase the number of students who are taking uh, AP and ECE classes and finding success. Thank you, Dr. Pong. Are there any final questions? Olivia. Uh, sorry, uh, just one more inquiry. Um, when you're concentrating on depth versus breadth, and I understand that I have um, I, my algebra teacher, well, we can't spend a lot of time on the homework that you guys were confused on last night because you've got to finish this by next week. And I'm really, I really like the idea of making it something real world because I was that kid, when are we ever going to use this? Every class. And I wasn't the only one. So I think that's a really great idea. But the depth versus breadth is going so far into depth um, and not exploring that many ideas, is that going to set anyone behind because they may not be able to reach all of the set goals because they have to take so much time? Is there any like, concern in that department? Again, there's a, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, and it's a balance. Uh, I think up to this point it's been coverage, coverage, coverage. It's been, it's been the, the breadth part. Um, and I can tell you that this is a national trend. AP US Advanced Placement US History just shifted. Uh, its emphasis from covering content, covering content, covering content to concepts, large important concepts in U.S. history and themes, and you have to understand those through specific content pieces. But how you teach that as a teacher 
is up to you. So I think this model mirrors that, that there's large concepts you know, that overarch the entire year as well as each unit and how you, and that's the expertise of the teacher is to know your students and customize it for their students to get them to that understanding. So it's a balance. It's a good question. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any final questions? Okay, we do have a motion on the floor and a second to uh, approve in pilot uh, for the fall. Uh, I'm going to, uh, in January, sorry. And I'm going to put that motion to a vote by a show of hands. All in favor? And what's your name? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Testa. Thank you, Mr. Bird. Can I just ask one question? I thought I would have someone say that the state is coming up with curriculums for other courses, eight, eight other that courses? That is correct. There are seven other courses. Seven other That's what correct. Are, what are some of those courses? Uh, I, uh, yeah, I think U.S. History is one. U.S. Um, history, biology, okay. English one, English two, chemistry. That's five. Those are the five I think that they were coming up with um, assessments for. And then there are three others that they're working on. But this is the first one. Okay. Are they all going to want smart books? That's a rhetorical question. We're looking for a real answer. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Burke, can you? You've already done it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Moving on to item 5.0, general business. Moving on to item 5.1, the disciplinary report from Maple Street School. Thank you. As um, Ms. Barker Jones comes uh, to the microphone, wanted to let you know that the uh, contents of her report, which is in your board packet, are, are the same as the previous two reports. Um, it looks a little bit different because Maple Street did not use the I-Pass, uh, excuse me, not know the Swiss system. Um, which is our PBIS system, they entered all their data, same data, but they entered all their data into our IPASS system. And so um, to pull that data out, it just looks a little different, but all of the same information is here, and Ms. Barker Jones presented this, so I will turn the microphone over to her, if that's all right with you, Mr. Holt. Thank you very much. Thank you, and good evening. Good evening. Uh, yes, our data looks a little bit different because we're not using the Swiss system, which automatically creates graphs and charts. So these um, were created from the discipline data from our IPASS system. So the first graph that you're going to have to pull your microphone right over so there. Sorry. I'm sorry. Is that better? Oh, oh yes. I'm sorry. So the first graph that you see is our referral totals by the month, which you saw in previous presentations in a chart form. So this is in a bar graph form. Um, you can see that we had about 12.9% uh, of our referrals in September. We had a lower number of referrals in November and December. And then you see a spike again in January and, and May. And this is our total year um, for a total number of referrals of 1,163. This is the referrals by classification. And these are the classifications that we utilize in IPASS. Um, so you may have a few more here than you saw in the Swiss system. And our most frequent classification is disruption, and that's the most number of referrals that were posted. There are 323 of those, um, down to the other ones where we have, um, for example, we have spitting was one for three and three of those. Uh, theft or stealing, we had three, so you'll see as you move to the right. So I've classified these from highest to lowest, rank them for you. These are consequences for referrals. Uh, the, the, the most frequent, again, I, I organize these from, from highest frequency to lowest frequency for you. The highest frequency was behavior intervention, followed by warnings, followed by lunch detentions, and the least used were after school detention or bus suspension last year. These are the referral totals for individual students, and so they're grouped. So the first bar that you see was students that received only one uh, discipline referral, and that was there were 27 students in that category. And then you'll see two to five and then they go up in ranges uh, a little bit higher, 6 to 10, 11 to 20, up to one student who received in excess of 91 referrals, but less than 100. 
The total enrollment last year for this data was 313. The total students receiving discipline referrals was 106, representing 34% of the population. And the total students receiving no referrals was 207, which means 66%. So two thirds of the children received no discipline referrals last year, and one just slightly over a third did. And then the last um, triangle that I did was our intervention pyramid for students with behavior referrals. And what you really want to see is you want to see 80% in the green area, 15% uh, in the yellow area, and only 5% in the red area. And you can see because we had a high concentration of students receiving discipline referrals that our red tri part of the triangle for last year was about 15%. And so that represents that 25% uh, of our students were receiving referrals with 75% uh, of our students receiving zero or only one referral. And those are the ends of my slides, and I would be happy to entertain questions at this point. Mr. Person. Um, the middle slide, the purple one that says consequences for referrals? Yes. Um, all the way down, it says parent. There was only two. Can you explain, was the parent contacted and not contacted for other reasons? Because I wasn't here last year, yeah. um, I, I don't know exactly how that was okay. uh, um, taken care of. The parent is always con is always con okay. uh, is always um, brought in. Um, sometimes this this may have been a little more intervention with a parent coming and sitting with a student, but it wasn't clear in the data, so I okay. could not explain Thank that. I apologize. Thank you. Mr. Kent. Yeah, parent contact and parent have more to do with that. Uh, you said the parents are always brought in. Parents are always called or notified. Either in a, either um, a personal phone call from the teacher, from the principal, or a letter. Sometimes we'll go home uh, occasionally and notice we'll go home uh, via the mail so parents know what's going on with the discipline. Are there any targets for staff for uh, the uh, contacts made uh, with parents? You mean how many t uh, times they uh, talk to a parent in a school year or? Day, week, month, year. Day, week. I, I've been meeting with my staff this year. I don't know what the policy was in the past um, at this point, but this year I'm asking that they're making at least five to ten phone calls a week, both positive, uh, mostly positive phone calls, but if they need to call a, a student who's having some difficulties, that's in, 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 in excess of that. So I'm um, trying to create positive. a positive environment. Good. Because I didn't know whether you might have some teachers that are really, uh, you know, on the ball making those positive and negative phone calls, and some aren't. You know, so that that's more evenly administered across the board. Um, the the, the, the uh, number of referrals per student chart that you have, mm -hmm. you, you indicated that of th the 313, uh, a, a large number have no referrals. Yet. Uh, of course, that's, that's good. Mm -hmm. You want that bigger. Um, unfortunately, I came up with some numbers here that you know just really bother me, uh, and that has to do with the one student between 91 and 100, mm -hmm. and then you've got three, and so on. And when you add up, you know. Three students times an average of 75 is 225 referrals, and one student yes. between that range is 95. It's 320 referrals, and then the other the five, four, and two kids, at the average of those, you come up with two. When you're done, you have 15 kids accounting for 675 of your, about of your 1,163 referrals. That's correct. Fifty-eight percent of all your referrals. I had the same conversation at the last board meeting with Mr. DeBellis. It's a very similar percentage. It was like, I don't know, two-thirds or something. You have 58 percent of all your headaches in 15 kids. That's, that's, that's last year's data. That's correct. Well, I mean, I, I really would hope that those 15 are getting some really intensive attention, and those parents are really getting some significant contact. 
That's so so on, on, the, on the good news piece of that, I will address that. There are students about around the same number, between 12 and 15, that um, I've been aware of since the beginning of the school year. I've been working with their parents. I've had almost every one of those parents either on the phone or in my office in the, in the first three weeks of school, uh, working with them and trying to figure out how we're going to work together to reduce this. I'm happy to say that one of the youngsters that's in the 70 to 80 category, um, she has had only one referral in three weeks. She's been a super behavior, um, doing really, really well. I've been working with her right from the very beginning because I wanted to, to make that play with her and she's just stepped up to the plate and doing an excellent job. I'm also working on um, what are we doing in the classroom to engage students so that there's less of this time for students to become disengaged. And so that's one of our big focuses this year is what are we doing as adults to make sure that we're providing the differentiated instruction and the, and the scaffolding needed for students to be engaged in their classroom and how do those things work. We're also moving to a lot more co-teaching so that I have my reading specialist and my special ed support staff working in the classroom in a more of an inclusionary model this year. And all of these pieces are working together very well. I'm not saying that everything is perfect, but we are concentrating on some of our students that have some special, special, special behavioral needs. And so we're working on it very hard. But I think the teachers are actually doing a great job this year. In that light. And I actually have shared this data with them and my, my comment is, last year there were 106 students representing 1,163 referrals, and 50% of those referrals were in this top category of about 15 children. So we're well aware of what's going on, and they're hearing the data from me all the time so that, that we can work on that together. So we're trying to move forward. Well, good. I'm going to make a, a, a wild guess and, and assume that in the other schools that we have, besides what Mr. DeVille's reported on, that those same percentages would probably bear out. Uh, there would be, you know, 58% of all of the referrals are coming from a, a select few in each of the other elementary schools. So if those strategies are working, then I would hope system-wide that, that we're implementing those similar strategies in each of the other schools. Uh, time will tell. We're going to, you know, we're, I'm monitoring it. We're keeping on top of it. This is September. We'll see how October and November go. By the end of the trimester, be welcome to give you a report on how, how we're improving and how some of our students are changing their category here for referrals. And so that, that would be some information to collect based on the work that we're doing in the first trimester. Well, yeah, good, sure. because when you have one kid doing 95 referrals, obviously whatever was being attempted was not working. I concur with you, yes, that's true. <coughs> Thank you. Are there any other questions? Ms. Goldfish. Can we go back to the purple one with the parent thing again? Yes. If parents are if parents are always contacted, why is that statistic not 1163? This is what I, I because I did not input the data. Um, I don't have the history on that. Uh, but as we are moving forward this year, every time we have a referral, parents contacted. Okay. So so moving forward. Moving forward, yes. Okay. Moving forward, yes. And if we could go to the the green one. This one. Uh, referral totals referral by class by classification. Yes, that's right. Some of the offenses. I, what is the correlation between offense and consequence? Like battery assault. Um, racial slurs and uh, what you would call a hate crime, um, physical intimidation, destruction of property, threats and intimidation. What are the consequences for these? I see in the consequence chart, I don't see, uh, there are no out of school suspensions. I don't see any expulsions. Um, I mean, something like physical intimidation or threat intimidation, what happens to the kid? Again, I cannot speak to what happened last year, and I was trying to make a correlation in our data. If our, in, within the data, if every time there's a, a referral that there's the consequences accurately reported, you can do that correlation. I didn't have that on 100%, so I didn't want to do that report because I feel that would be unfair if you don't have it for 100% of them. Currently, what we're doing is, um, I, I'm happy to say that I, I haven't had any real physical assaults 
at this point. Um, I haven't even had a racial slur, so I haven't had any of that at this point. Um, I have had to, um, I did have to send, in, I, did have, I did have three suspensions so far this year. Um, one of those suspensions was for a child who threw a chair and we could not calm the child down and the parent come in, so the parent took the child home with two hours left in the school day. Under state law, more than 90 minutes is, is, a, is a suspension. And uh, another child who actually did something similar, you know, with uh, throwing an object or in the, in the classroom, same thing, had the mother come in for the last two hours of the day to meet with me and then take the child home. And the other one actually um, left the classroom um, and left the building and brought him back in, but had the mother come in. And we, um, he went home and actually had another day because he was going to be working with the counselor the following day outside, externally. So we gave him he had a two day suspension. Um, those are the only serious incidents that I've had to this point. How they were dealt with a, on, on a level last year, I cannot speak to. But going forward, there will be a correlation between the offense. Yes, and for every discipline referral I put in, I put the consequence in, whether it be a, a simple warning or whether it's, um, and I don't, the parent piece, since all my parents are contacted, I'm really focusing on what the actual, and we've instituted a new one this year also, which has been extremely effective called community service. So I had a child with a, a little slight incident in the cafeteria. He had to wipe the cafeteria tables down every morning for three days. Would that solve the problem? So we're trying to do that also, where we can have a consequence that also has some meaning to the student about why you don't throw something in the cafeteria and why you don't tip something over. So we're working on these with my teams of teachers and trying to come up with better ways to, to um, put out consequences to uh, eradicate the behaviors. Thank you. You're welcome. Any further questions? Thank you very much for your report this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. The next item is an item that was in the uh, blue folder this evening. It's item 5.15, Cape uh, Board Recognition Award. Dr. Cohen. Thank you, Mr. Poole. I'm sure Mrs. Bush could also speak with uh, to this uh, indicator. We did receive an email from Cabe reminding us that it was time to reapply for the Leadership Award. Uh, and before the Board can move into the uh, Board of Distinction Award, uh, we must be, the Board must be, uh, for two years, be, receive a Leadership Award. Um, the same boxes have been checked uh, except for one. Uh, last year, in uh, Area 6, Related Organizational Leadership, we were fortunate to have the uh, National uh, School Boards Association Conference in Boston, and several of you did go to that uh, last year. So that's one we cannot check this year, um, is uh, letter D, which is at the top of the, um, the fourth column of page there. Um, otherwise, all of the same boxes have been checked. The board has um, certainly kept up with all of the leadership activities that it has, uh, it has done. And so um, I'm, it, this is entirely up to you. I think it was, uh, it's, it's good when the board is doing a good job to uh, let other people know and let yourselves know. So this is up to you. If you uh, wish to apply, we will have Mr. Rule sign it, and I will sign it, and we will get that in. Um, last year we did it on our October 9th meeting. So we're at about, about the same time frame. This would be given out at the Cape Caps Convention, November 15. Ms. Bush. I'd like to make the motion that the Vernon Board of Education apply for the Cape Board Recognition Awards. Mr. Butar. I second it. We have a motion from Mrs. Bush and a second from Mr. Butar uh, to submit for the uh, Cape Recognition Award. Is there any discussion? Seeing no hands for discussion, I'm going to call the motion to a vote by a show of hands. All in favor? And those opposed? I show one opposed. The motion does carry. Question? Mr. Uh, item two, the new board member are provided orientation including 
attending a new board member orientation. Is that uh, before uh, they become elected uh, or after? Uh, there is a, I'm sorry. Sorry. Thank you. Um, but there is one uh, before they become a member that is called So You Want to Be a Board Member. Uh, we did send all the new candidates uh, a, a brochure for that uh, and suggested that they do that. But there is usually the first week in December or just before that, there is a day um, for board members. And we did have board members attend that uh, after the last election. We haven't had any new board members since then. Yeah, which, which point we pay for it. I, I, yes. I still think we should pay for those that are considering becoming board members because it might make it a lot easier for them and us when they are new arrivals uh, in the board chambers. And I don't think we currently fund that. I just think we should. It would be a lot of money. It might be more worth it the next time. Thank you, Mr. Kim. All right, moving on to item 5.2, uh, Facilities Committee Report, uh, Dr. Conlon. Thank you very much. Um, I will turn this over to Mr. Kemp in a moment. Uh, the Board's uh, Facilities Committee did receive just a very brief overview, uh, which is all we have right now on our school security grant. Uh, we did receive it for six of our seven schools. The high school was not included. We're not sure why yet. We have not received the award letter. Um, so we are, are still waiting to see exactly what that means. Uh, we're very hopeful we'll get that soon. Uh, right now, my concern is that we do need to have the town approve the entire amount so that it can, uh, it can be reimbursed, 71% of it can be reimbursed for the town, but we are required to approve the entire amount. So we're uh, working with the, um, the mayor's office on the next steps for that, um, what that would be involved in. Um, the next uh, part of the facilities committee was a request to approve the um, installation of two pieces of playground equipment. One was a purchase and installation, and then the other was an installation. Mr. Kemp, do you want to do that? Or do you want me to do that? Well, the, the, the most important part of the whole uh, meeting was <coughs> um, So, yeah, there's a couple of playscapes that were approved. That, and a handicapped swing at, at uh, Center Road School. And then, of course, the PMBC's uh, upcoming inspection of uh, Center Road School on the 25th, at Wednesday at 7 p.m. That's uh, upcoming. And then uh, I think Terry asked the question in the committee about the health clinic. Terry, maybe you'd like to follow up. Was that Laura? I'm sorry, Laura, maybe you'd like to elaborate on your question on the health clinic at RHS? Uh, basically, I just wanted to get a status of the um, health clinic and where it stands. Uh, at this point, they are coming up with their final plans, and they're going to be submitting them to the building department, and um, they're looking for approval. We do not have a timeline yet when they would be completed, but um, it is underway, and they, do, they did uh, give us the basic plan for it. And they're looking, uh, if everything is approved, they're looking to uh, put a bathroom in the high school, and they'll need to probably do it during uh, the winter break so that they can do some demolition in the flooring to be able to put the correct plumbing in and stuff. So uh, it's underway, and uh, we'll be getting reports along the way. Mr. Kemp, do we need to take any action as a board on the playscapes? Uh, I assume we do, uh, and I don't know what the well, format the, motion would yeah, be. The committee that, uh, approved both of them, uh, meaning they're recommending we go to the full board for approval, the uh, handicapped swing, motion was uh, to approve it pending uh, availability of, of uh, funds. And Mrs. Buell has assured us that um, the funds are there in the special ed area. Okay. okay, so can I have that in the form of uh, an official motion, Mr. Kemp? Sure. Um, you made the motion, didn't you? Yes, I did. Okay. I'd like to make 
Any motion that we'll start with the, the handicap swing for Center Road School be approved uh, with approved funding? Okay. And do I have a second on that motion? I have a second from Ms. Goldich. Okay, so that's for a handicap swing at the place gate at Center Road School. Any uh, discussion on that motion? Seeing none, uh, let's call for a vote by a show of hands. All in favor? And that's unanimous. And the second motion, Ms. Bush? All right. Uh, I'd like to make a motion that the place scape at NES uh, be approved for installation. Uh, it's something that is a gift, a donation of funds from the school readiness. I have a motion on Northeast uh, School Place Good, and do I have a second? Ms. Goldich, I have a second. Is there any discussion on that motion? Um, Mr. Hill, if I may just add, that is for um, the, the one piece of equipment is for two, <coughs> excuse me, children who are between two and five years of age. Thank you. So with, for the bread, that's why the readiness funds are five years. Right. Is there any other questions or information? Seeing none, I'm going to call for a vote by a show of hands. All in favor? And that's unanimous. Thank you. Is there anything else in your report, Mr. Kim? Thank you. So we'll move on to item 5.3, reports from Board of Education Liaisons reporting attendance to organizations and committee meetings. Does anybody have a report? Ms. Fisher? I just want to report that I went to uh, Center Rhodes PTO meeting and 89% of their students participated in their summer reading program. Um, they have a jogging club going on two times a week and they are participating in Heart for Marathon <coughs> following the footsteps of Skinner Road School. And they're hoping to host a vocabulary day and literacy night coming up soon for the students. And their ice cream social is this Friday night. Thank you for that report. Mr. Percy. Uh, I went to the BCMS PTO meeting. Um, Chris Abjace, the, uh, I can't get his title wrong. Food Nutrition Service Director. 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 Um, gave a nice presentation to the, to the PTO about you know, what, what they're allowed to sell and stuff like that. He spoke of the food truck. Um, so it was nice to see him. He's getting out there to all the PTOs. Um, um, BCMS is doing their one fundraiser a year that's the magazine drive so they're looking for help with that and they have a busy year, year ahead like they always do. Thank you. Thank you Mr. Percy. Mrs. Bush. Yes I attended the um, the Ag Department uh, alumni night and uh, the meeting they have and they're getting uh, going forward with many of the fundraisers but something to bring to your attention they have the Welcome Freshman Ag Night where they have their um, silent auction and their uh, cake and pie and healthy alternative um, uh, as well auction. And that will be on the, that will be on Wednesday, October 9th. And uh, this, this uh, sign ups and the auction items will be available at 5 p.m. and it will go all the way uh, until 8 p.m. and they'll be highlighting a lot of the projects from the students from last year to show the freshmen coming in. Thank you, Mr. Bush. Are there any other reports this evening? Mr. Kemp. Well, I did go to the RHS Open House, very uh, well attended, very uh, good event. Uh, there was a Vernon L opening uh, opportunity which I did go to and then later it's opening open house and then many of us went to the opening and convocation of staff which was a very pleasant experience to uh, be a part of. Thank you Mr. Kent. Are there any other reports? Seeing none we'll move on uh, to item 5.3 um, this is an anticipated executive session item. It's a request for a leave of absence. And I would like to obtain a motion to um, go into executive session to discuss that. And then uh, item 5.4 is also going to be an executive session item. 
Uh, and if we wish, um, we could look to go into executive session after we review the calendar, allow the uh, press to ask questions, and then we can clear the auditorium and go to the... Uh, oh, there will be a motion on that, so we have, okay, we do need to do this one first, then. Okay, catch that. So we're going to do 3 point, uh, 5 point 3 five. Uh, we're going to have to do a quick executive session and then come back and we can make a motion. Um, if I can get a motion, Mr. Person. We'll be going into executive session. Item 5.35, inviting the superintendent. Motion from Mr. Percy and inviting the superintendent. Is there anybody else? And Ms. Fisher, second. Thank you. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor of going into executive session? And Mr. Kemp? Executives, thank you. Or are you And I'll note that Mr. Bukar has left the room. Go up on the stage for two seconds. And it's just a quick question. We'll be back in just a couple minutes. Okay, we are back from executive session. Uh, Mr. Person. I'd like to make a motion to the Board of Education to approve an unpaid leave of absence from October 9th, 2013 through October 25th, 2013 for a specific employee as discussed in the executive session. I have a motion. Do I have a second, Ms. Fisher? Second. I have a second from Ms. Fisher. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, I'm going to call for a vote by a show of hands. All in favor? And that your motion is unanimous. And I would show that Mr. Bouton has just returned to the room. Okay, moving on to item 5.4. Again, this is going to be to go into executive session. Um, I would uh, just take the privilege of the chair to ask, do we have any calendar updates for item 6.0 before we handle 5.4? I don't see any calendar updates. Okay. And I'm going to give the press an opportunity for questions. Uh, Mr. Kennedy, any questions this evening? Okay. And so I'll take a motion to go into executive session, and we'll be going to the library. Uh, Mr. Percy. Move to go into executive session for 5.4, right in the superintendent. Nope. There will no, be no just the board. Thank just the board. you. Okay, I have a motion. Do I have a second? Mr. Fisher, I have a second. Is there any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, uh, all in favor of going into executive session? And that's unanimous. We are in executive sessions in the library. 